Hymnody is a tough thing. Sometimes the words are perfect and the tunes less so. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for all you did to make the yard sale a smashing success. The money is amazing, but so is the community building that happened. And we have the nicest group of people here. Marie and I probably keep different profit and loss sheets, but uh, yes, I do. <laughs> but for me, the community is so much richer for having shared this. This is the end of my pastoral year, and I also want to say thank you for, because I think of my years running as our financial year runs from July to July. Um, I also want to say thank you for all you did this year. We accomplished a lot. None of my clergy f fellows can understand that a church, let alone a denomination, would recommend a study month. I can't tell you how much a better preacher and pastor I am for that. Remember how I told you I was reading nothing of value this summer? Well, I just checked my Kindle, and that's not going to be quite true. But it's mostly true. And the time uh, makes me a better person, too. It fills me up with things that are not church. I feel very daring. I'm taking that email fast. But there's been a lot of email feasting this year. So I'm interested to see what happens. They say it takes you a week off, the, off a device before your brain starts to act like a different brain. Um, I'm also very grateful for the care and the space you gave me when I was sick. Bill and I were talking about how tired he was. He said, well, wait, you're also tired because it's the end of the year and you've had a busy, productive year. Oh, right. But here we are singing our doo-wop song, I'll See You in September. A friend asked me if I were just going to say, OK, great, let's have coffee and cookies. And I thought, what? Give up a chance to preach? Ha. Saturday morning, however, I was thinking, wow, maybe I should think about finding Mrs. Moyer's brownie recipe. However, truth is, I like writing a lot better than I like shopping and baking, so here I stand. I've told you that I spent my time being sick with Louise Penny in her Three Pines Mysteries. In her series, Don't Believe Everything You Think, is the phrase Inspector Gamache teaches his detectives, along with the four questions that Je Jeannie read this morning. The phrase isn't hers. It's been around for quite a while. I checked. There are at least four books with this title. Um, and Ed, is this a Buddhist, an old Buddhist something? Because one of the, there's a Buddhist book with this, um, and there was a there was a mistake because she said it was Pema Chodron, but it wasn't. It was somebody else Chodron. <laughs> Awful. No, I saw their picture. She was tall and skinny and had dark hair, as opposed to Pema, who is very tiny. Um, but it caught me off guard, and it made me think. As I reflected, I realized that this is really the mantra for the fourth principle. The fourth principle reminds us we are to be seekers. Our thoughts, opinions, and decisions often get in the way of changed and changing minds and hearts. We are invited to put those thoughts aside which is a lovely phrase, don't you think, for rooting out m mental kudzu, um, so that new, deeper, wider thoughts can enter in. In relationship and in the wider world, one of my problems is how I perceive things and then what I tell myself about them. For instance, and I'm sure this is the only me, no one else will have this problem, but I have my own strong sense of right and wrong that often gets in the way of my understanding what's true for the other person. Because sometimes the other person's sense of right and wrong will not jibe with mine. Nonetheless, I can be dogged about being right. But this makes no place for dialogue. And there's certainly no room for that. In, for peace in that. My way or the highway is not really a phrase that belongs in the peace toolbox. 
And yet, it's a great fallback notion, isn't it, for many of us. And I suspect, though it's unpleasant to admit, I'm not the only person who makes myself crazy because the world isn't as I think it should be. The world is what it is. For me and for others affirming the fourth principle, we're here to ask, how do I find meaning in this situation? And only then may I ask myself, how do I act to make it different, better, more just, more peaceful? As I keep saying, starting in September, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a welcoming congregation. I can't imagine any of us really understand what that will mean to us as we work to open our hearts along with our doors. Are we willing to work not on racism, but rather on white supremacy? Not on poverty, but on class privilege. That would be our class privilege. Not on GLBTQ issues, but on our own heteronormative I don't think I've ever used that word in a, um, writing or speaking, decision-making, right? Not on disabilities, but our own enjoyment of a world that is not accessible to everyone. Is it possible we'll find ourselves unwilling to root up our fragility and our desire to see the world as a level playing field on top of which we just magically happen to land so that the people might live? Isn't that the prayer we want to be praying and living into, that the people might live? Am I willing to do the same excavation in my personal life as well? A beloved shrink used to ask and ask and ask and ask, what are you telling yourself about what is true? Sometimes even I could see where my thoughts about what I thought should happen had nothing to do with what was, and that my thoughts didn't help me navigate the possibility, uh, the realities or the possibilities. Other times he had to work a bit harder before he could just shove me out the door in preparation for the next person who would be doing pretty much the same work. It's the work of becoming human, I think. And we all have so much of this work to do. It will be interesting to see if the work to welcome people, the move outward with hands extended, will force us to make those own um, inward journeys to extend ourselves, extend ourselves the self-same hands. Those journeys are tentative and often the scenery is or will be less than beautiful. But we cannot open our doors without excavating our hearts. We have to put our privilege aside. Perhaps before we do that, we have to acknowledge it. The world needs the refuge that the UUCSV can provide. It needs us to make space, and then it needs our special skills to make it welcoming. It's easy to think that special skills belong to only a few, but each and every one of us has skills. We do our best work when we use our best skills and talents. There's an old Gnostic proverb that says, if we aren't generous with the best of us, it will kill us. And we don't know where our skills will change thing, things. One of my favorite incidents from this year was when Kathy Staten and her wonderful quartet played for us. You, do you know, I heard that was the last time they will play together. Two of the women feel that their hands are uh, just can't readapt and they can't work them up. So it wasn't just the wonderful blessing that it was, but it was really an incredible gift that we had to have them there. But it happened to be Father's Day that day, and who would imagine that one of those songs would take Gilberto, newly arrived from Texas, back to a Mexican city walking with his dad. I mean, it happened here. That's pretty miraculous, I, I think. But doing what you love to do gives people pleasure and can make a difference. So I'm asking, what are the gifts you can give the church this year? Summer's a good time to think about this. We're buying our home. We're going to ha have a plan and have to have a plan and organize that. It's calling out for some of you. We're going to raise money to feed people and to support good product projects like this one with the River Keeper, which will be working with young men in the prison system and teaching them about the river and its management. 
we're going to have to learn about topics in the news and how to respond as a church and as individuals. Last week about hearing about the 52 overdoses in Williamsport, I was overwhelmed. Luckily, I saw Bill and Kathy Staten and remembered that their daughter Cheryl had worked very effectively on a drug epidemic in Lewistown before she worked at Susquehanna Hospital Systems. And I called her. And when she responded to my message and set up a date to talk, she reminded me that her husband also had a lot of experience in addiction health care. This heroin epidemic is so frightening and so confusing. And you think, who are we? Who are we? The short story on it apparently is that they think that this was a lab mistake that happened. Maybe they knew it went wrong, maybe they didn't. But actually, there have been books written about how the drug dealers and the larger cartels are really very astute business people. They really don't want to sell something that will kill their users. It dries up the market. It's bad business. So why, they didn't, why would they have done that? But the hospital and the local people have called in the FBI because they just don't know what to do. The whole hospital is shaken from the huge work surge, the multitude of near deaths, and the fact that they have to release people back into the community with no aftercare. There is no aftercare. Is that going to get better or worse? There's something, you know, the health care debacle is something we might want to lobby on. So I asked Cheryl and Brad if come the fall they'd come and have a talk. A Dr. Joseph Priestley lecture, our doctor, our, who was a medical doctor as well. Um, they said yes. And then when I've spoken to people like my primary care doc and to ministerial colleagues, they want to come as well. So this could be... You know, I always think that we're here in a great position to offer information. But what I understood from our conversation was how much more nuanced problems are than I think and how much they overlap. Poverty, health care, education. And recently, thanks to mostly to Barb Schaefer, I've been reading stuff on chronic pain and its needs, which are very different and very separate from this. And so how do we make sure that people, you know, how, can we help? I don't know. Um, but so we need to be thinking in, in different ways. We need to be reading or listening to experts on these problems. We are not separate from any of them. We are the same people. We need each other to survive. We aren't going to solve these problems, but we can know enough to ask good questions. That's part of being a good citizen, and that's our fifth principle. As a community, we are on the cusp of something wonderful. We have people who like each other and like what we're engaged in. We have people who give of themselves and their resources. On the hard journeys we have to make, we have company. We must remember that the beauty we can find in one another can be incredible support for the work we have to do. It's big work. It's frightening work. There's stuff we'll not want to know about ourselves and even some of our neighbors. Trust that that is true for all of us. And I know for me there is stuff going on in, in this world about which I prefer to remain naive. Trust that this is happening and true for all of us. But we have kindness and community to support us. The world, the world is really in chaos right now. And it's difficult to remember that the Chinese character, Chinese or Japanese character for chaos, is it Chinese? Is um, opportunity. And um, so, and it's, it's got thing, it, it's a, there are at least figures that are leaned against one another, and it's the pressure of one against the other that holds them up. And so it might be an interesting uh, symbol to have somewhere around. Um, but so this may be the end of Louise Penny's being my theologian for the summer. Um, although she has a new book coming out at the very end of August. Some of us are, ac are waiting. And um, she's going to be speaking at the Brown Library this year. She's their um, speaker, so at their gala, so if you wanted to go. But most of her books, which of course I also like, wrestle with redemption and finding the way back to 
from where we might have lost ourselves. And when we look out at this world, I think we, a lot of us have that feeling that we're lost. And, uh, but she uses a lot of poetry in her books. There's a long and lovely quote from an Auden poem on Herman Melville about evil. But in it is the phrase, a crowd of faults and how we are all a crowd of faults and that we need to learn to live with that. Um, it's a lovely phrase. But the work is to step by slow step to move away from those faults and to repair them. I leave you for the summer with the words of one of her, char one of her characters spoke to a young man trying to decide whether or not to commit suicide. He begins by reminding the man-child that when you have lived with evil, you distrust goodness when it shows up and refuse to believe in it. The world turned upside down. It was at once more beautiful and frightening than you'd been led to believe, and suddenly you didn't know what to do, who to trust, where to turn. It's terrifying. Being lost is so much worse than being on the wrong road. That's why people stay on it for so long. We're too far gone, or so we think. We're tired, we're confused, and we're scared. And we think there's no way back. I know. I'm off for the summer. Many of you are as well. May we remember, if we dare, to look at some of the stuff that there is a home to come back to. By the time September comes, it will be our home, we hope, absolutely ours. Um, I wish for all of us that we may be safe and happy, filled with kindness and peace. I love you all. Have a good summer. <laughs>